Hello. Okay. <laughs> Welcome to the Minetti Shore Museum. My name is Juliana and I'm a visitor services student staffer. Before we begin today's program, we should take a moment to acknowledge the land on which UC Davis sits. For thousands of years, this land has been the home of Putwin people. Today, there are three federally recognized Putwin tribes, Kachildihi Band of Wintun Indians of the Kalusa Indian Community, Kletseldihi Wintun Nation, and Yocha Dihi Wintun Nation. The Putwin people have remained committed to the stewardship of this land over many centuries. It has been cherished and protected as elders have instructed the young through generations. We are honored and grateful to be here today on their traditional lands. Thank you. Hey everybody, thanks for being here. I'll keep this brief. Um, I'm Simon Sadler and I'm chair of the Department of Design. And it's my pleasure to be welcoming you all to the spring 2024 Alberini Family Lecture. We're so pleased that Dori Tunstall accepted our invitation to be here the last couple of days. Dr. Tunstall has been a leading light, arguably the leading light, in showing how the design discipline can open to wider cultural perspectives, in particular through strategic academic leadership. I'd like to thank many colleagues for their work in making this event happen. A quick shout out to Christina Cogdell, Crystal Masuda, Michael French, Paul Duggan, Randy Roberts, and Jeremy Poulos, amongst others. Most important, this speaker series is supported through a generous endowment by the Carlos and Andrea Alberini Family Foundation, which brings renowned innovators and thinkers in design to campus to inspire students and encourage community engagement and learning. We remain profoundly grateful to the Alberini family for its endowment of this speaker series, which is central to the intellectual life of our department and its students. Thank you as well to Rachel Teagle and the Minetti Schrem Museum for their very generous co-sponsorship of this lecture and for hosting us. It's always such a delight to be in this fabulous space. I'm handing over now to my colleague, Professor Javier Arbona, who will introduce our guest. Good evening, all. And it's quite an honor to be here. Thank you, Simon. Um, really introducing uh, Dr. Dory Tunstall uh, to you all. I will be very, very brief. I think what I'll do is I just want to do the official bio. And really, if you would indulge me a couple of really quick comments, um, just to really contextualize the talk for, for the audience tonight. Uh, first of all, Dr. Elizabeth Dory Tunstall. Uh, is a PhD from Stanford Anthropology in 1999, is a distinguished design anthropologist, celebrated author, visionary organizational design leader, consultant, and coach. As the renowned author of Decolonizing Design, a cultural justice guidebook, she is a pathbreaker of progressive approaches that challenge conventional design paradigms that exclude and harm indigenous cultures in order to decolonize those paradigms and approaches that champion diversity, equity, and inclusivity practices in communities, communities and organizations. With a global career encompassing an associate professor of design anthropology at the University of Illinois at Chicago and Swinburne University in Australia, respectively, Dory made history as the first black and black female dean of a design faculty anywhere at Ontario College of Art and Design, OCAD, as uh, we like to call it, in Toronto, at the, um, in Toronto, Canada. Her accomplishments have been recognized with numerous prestigious awards, notably the 2022 Sir Misha Black Award for Distinguished Service for Design Education, the inaug inaugur inaugural BADG, which I suppose they probably uh, want us to pronounce as badge of honor for design education uh, from the Black Artists uh, and Designers Guide and the 2023 uh, Society of Experiential Graphic Design, SEGD, Excellence in Design Education Award. Dory's profound commitment to making an expansive impact beyond academia has recently led her to establish uh, Dory Tunstall Inc., a firm dedicated to decolonizing and diversifying institutional processes for companies and organizations um, through corporate education, executive coaching, and strategic consulting. 
Um, and I could, if I could just say very, very briefly, it, it's such, uh, really such a, such a joy and, and, and an honor to have these conversations with Dr. Tunstall. Um, I wanted to say that the, the design department has been having conversations for several, I would say several years now to really think more forcefully about how the department is committed to climate transitions, to social and environmental justice, to decolonial thinking. And in, in, I think in that same, um, you know, and really in that same tradition, now we've had a number of Alberini speakers and Sarah Hendren comes to mind, Leslie Ann Noel, and Jacinda Walker. And I think Dr. Tunstall is also, I think in that, uh, in that same tradition that, um, you know, of, those, of these distinguished lectures. I personally teach uh, a design ethnography course in the design department. So I think also uh, in design ethnography, just to put it very briefly, we try to reflect back on the methods that designers use and, and how design is constantly in flux, right? So design, th design ethnography is, is a method through which we have to uh, constantly be kind of in motion and ethnography uh, provides us with the tools to always be analyzing that dynamism. So I think that given uh, the book, uh, decolonizing design, it will definitely be on my syllabus. Um, in, in this course, we like to say that ethnography and design are constantly in mutual provocation, if I could borrow from anthropologists. And in that same spirit, I think uh, Dory Tunstall's work really fits into that mutual provocation be between design and ethnography. So we will, we will be reading this for any of you who are undergrads and will be taking Design 126. Look forward to that. So if you would just join me in welcoming Dr. Dory Tunstall tonight, a round of applause, and I'll hand over the mic. Because I'm shorter than everyone else. <laughs> um, I, again, they've already started with the uh, land acknowledgement there, but as I travel around the world uh, for places that don't do the land acknowledgement, I normally include that as my first slide. Um, uh, the student expressed it so eloquently and heartfeltfully that I, again, I just want to point out and recognize the importance of that as we start and engage um, in an understanding of being in a sense of place, being a sense of like who are the true custodians of that place and how that informs how we go forward in the work that we do. Um, okay, here we go. Um, but I also recognize I, I currently live in LA, so I also recognize that I am a guest <laughs> Um, on the lands of in LA, so I acknowledge that I occupy lands originally and still inhabited and cared for by the Tongva, Tatavarium, Serrano, Kush, and Shumash peoples, and I honor and pay respect to their elders and descendants, past, present, and emerging, as they continue their stewardship over these lands and waters. By way of introduction, I'm Elizabeth Dory Tunstall, daughter of Teresa and Joseph, daughter of Raymond and Letha, granddaughter of Dolores and Johnny, granddaughter of Betty and George, great-granddaughter of Katrina and Raymond, and descendants of other ancestors known and unknown, Ashe. I was born in Columbia, South Carolina, on the lands of the Catawba, Pidi, Chikora, Adisto, Santi, Yamase, and Chikora Wakamao nations, and I grew up in Indianapolis, Indiana, on the lands of the Kikapu, Kashkashia, and Miami nations. And I'm here to talk to you about Decolonizing Design, a Cultural Justice Guidebook, which is here, and I'll put that over there. Um, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to my amazing design team for uh, the book. So the cover design is by Sadie Redwing, who is a Lakota, uh, Dakota designer. <laughs> And uh, the, uh, I want to pay attention to the mandala that surrounds the illustration done by me by Ina Agi, who's a Nigerian-Canadian illustrator, uh, because the brief for Sadie, who I've worked with and mentored for many, many years, was uh, to surround me in indigenous love. 
Um, and she said there's a little bit of protection in there too. <laughs> um, and so I want to give a shout out to, to, to the way in which community, this is a communal book, even though I'm talking about it and the author, it is a communal book that expresses both in form and content the things that we collectively believe. And the inside of the book is done by Polymode Studio, which is a African and American and uh, indigenous <laughs> team of uh, Silas Monroe and Brian Johnson. Um, and so again, this is how form and content come together in terms of building a team that reflects the ideas and the promises uh, that are made in the book. So Decolonizing Design, a Cultural Justice Kind book, uh, is a culmination of uh, 30, 40, 30 years uh, plus of life experiences in trying to figure out in some ways what's my relationship to the places that I've grown up in, the places that I've lived. Um, what is my relationship to design as a set of practices, which um, as an anthropologist, I've been trained to understand the role of anthropology in the process of colonization. Um, but those conversations haven't been held as deeply in the field of design. Um, the context for the book was coming in some ways out of the fact that 2020, when I say there was a racial reckoning happening in the United States that was prompted by the murder of George Floyd, um, and the fact that the pandemic, the COVID pandemic, has slowed down life enough that people who normally would not have to pay attention to those things could all of a sudden had to pay attention. Um, that at the same time, OCAD University was announcing the results of our Black Cluster hire, which addressed 144 years of zero representation of full-time Black faculty uh, in the Faculty of Design. Um, so everyone was calling me saying, uh, what do we do? What do we do? Uh, what can we do? Um, and a lot of young people were putting these DI positions um, and they were calling me to ask, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? How do I operate in these institutions and organizations that are not designed for me to survive in? So the book came out of me running out of time to have the one-on-one -on -one conversations <laughs> with everyone, uh, trying to understand uh, what decolonizing design means. And for me, it's meant five things. Uh, Putting indigenous first, and that's one of the topics that I'm gonna talk about. Um, dismantling the tech bias in the European modernist project, dismantling the racist bias in the European modernist project, um, making amends through more than diversity, equity, inclusion, and reprioritizing existing resources to decolonize. Uh, I don't have time to go through the whole entire book with you because I do want to leave uh, time for Q&A. <laughs> um, but I will talk about putting Indigenous first. Um, and I'm going to talk about making amends through more than diversity, inclusion, and equity. So what might decolonizing design mean? Again, for me, it's putting Indigenous first. Well, actually, in this context, it's putting Native Americans first. And then after dinner last night, <laughs> it was putting Patwin peoples first. Um, the importance, again, of the land acknowledgement is to remind you of where you are and who are the original custodians of the land. Um, Decolonization is local. It is local. Um, and it means really focusing on who are the people of the land and what are you doing in your everyday actions that um, facilitates their rematriation as the land. 
as the land. And so uh, as I'll go through a little bit of like 101 about colonization, I, I want to remind you uh, that it is a local thing, that it is about those local actions that you're taking that defines whether or not you're actually engaged in a decolonizing structure. Um, so again, I don't know why this keeps repeating. Okay. Some really weird things are happening to my slides. So let me go out of slideshow because it's, this is not re, it is not representing what is actually on my slides. Okay. So to talk about decolonization, you have to first understand what colonization is. And so the story of this place, beautifully illustrated. Um, I don't know if you've all had the opportunity to uh, check out the museum space or exhibition that was held um, in Cressy. Did I say that right? Cressy? Crusoe. <laughs> um, is, um, again, a group of Europeans. Let's see. A group of Europeans um, escaping great pain and suffering in Europe, got on a bunch of boats and came to, let's say in this case, the United States. Uh, the act of them coming to the United States uh, was genocidal. Uh, some of that genocidal actions was unintentional. They came with a bunch of diseases that indigenous peoples, Native American peoples, uh, didn't have immunity to. Uh, but also a lot of it was quite intentional. Um, and uh, because of the decimation of the Native American population, uh, they brought over a group of Africans, enslaved them, in order to provide labor on the land. Um, and so, and then they went to tell stories about ways in which uh, these African people deserve to be enslaved. Uh, these Native American peoples deserved to lose their lands. And the repercussions of those actions are still continuing today. When I first went to Canada, there was a term that they were using there that I was unfamiliar with because I was coming from Australia, actually. Um, and they kept talking about BIPOC, BIPOC this, BIPOC that, BIPOC this. And I was like, Black Indigenous POC? Wait, how did Black people get excluded from POC? Because I understood the history of the term coming from, again, big women's conference in the 1960s slash 70s, Black women creating a list of things, demands, again, other women looking at that list and saying, hey, we have the same issues as well. And so how do we come together? We call ourselves women of color who are demanding these things and then opening up to a wider range of genders. We say people of color. So how did black people get excluded from the POC category? And the way in which it was explained to me was that indigenous peoples, uh, POC people, which in this context means Latinx, Asian, uh, Middle Eastern, anyone who's sort of non-European, non-white, -Euro non non-black, non-indigenous, uh, uh, that they have very different experiences and very different needs. And I then sort of trying to theorize this for myself, so okay, let me better define what those things are. Um, there's a wonderful essay that if you haven't read, you should read, uh, especially right now, in terms of decolonization is not a metaphor, by Eve Tuck and uh, Kay Wang Yang, um, because it talks about the ways in which a settler colonial state, like the United States, sets up these positionalities. You have native, you have settler, 
and you have slave. Now, they're very careful in how they discuss this to not ascribe these two specific identities. Um, but for me, it was helpful to like play with that a little bit because it helped me understand, ah, the differences has to do with the differences in our relationship to the land and the differences in our relationship to assimilationist policies that were set up by the settler colonial state. So indigenous people, in terms of positionality, uh, again, are native, but also slaves, right? Um, there, that they were the original populations that had been enslaved, right, before the Europeans uh, brought over um, Africans, right, to serve that role. Again, original custodians of the land, that is the relationship to the land. Uh, as as my, uh, one of my indigenous colleagues had said to me is like, no, they are the land. We are the land. <laughs> um, and has been, you know, for the last 500 years or so fighting assimilation. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, again, black folks brought in generally as enslaved. Um, but actually sometimes operating as settlers, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, again, involuntarily brought to the land. And, um, and basically in terms of the settler colonial state, unassimilatable. The whole structure of white supremacy is defined by the exclusion of black folks. And I'll go deeper into that. So again, my name is Elizabeth Tunstall. My first language is English. Um, like, I think it's maybe like 87% of African Americans are uh, Christian. The, in some ways, the success of uh, assimilation is reflected in the ways in which prohibitions means that this is my language, this is my name, these are some of the practices that we have. And yet, the reason why we have to say Black Lives Matter is that every institutional structure says that you don't, you don't belong. We will not service you. We will treat you. We will not serve and protect. Um, and then the, now we get into the POC. And again, it is, not, it is not a term that deals with all the nuances of identity um, that exist amongst the POC groups. Um, but it does reflect the fact that Many of them come as settlers um, under great duress, right? Like they are leaving the damages of colonization that have happened on their homelands to try to build a better life um, in the United States. And as such, um, they get caught in between this structure of black and whiteness in which they have to make hard decisions around assimilation. Do I or do not teach my children the language that they speak? Do I give them a Anglo name so that they fit in? And the ability to assimilate or not assimilate is based on, again, what class position they may have held, how much wealth, how much education they have in the homelands that they left. But they do make hard decisions about whether or not they want to assimilate or need to assimilate into these, uh, again, the settler colonial states. So for me, the first part of decolonization, uh, which again is about rematriation of Native Americans uh, to the land is everyone figuring out what is your positionality in relationship to that struggle. And so understanding why there is a BIPOC, why there is this understanding there's different strategies in which, again, the, the settler colonial state has sought to bring us into the system. And there's different intentionalities in terms of how we've been in, engaged. And there's different strategies that have to be put in place in terms of how we create the conditions for true liberation. And it's important to do the work, because uh, in the amazing words of Vine Deloria Jr., like again, there's been different strategies that have been employed. 
for black folks, you don't belong. You can't have access. Again, for indigenous folks, we will put you in residential schools to remove you from your language, remove you from your culture, remove you from your community, remove you from like your practices, remove you from your religion, all those things to turn you into an Anglo-Saxon against your will. These are different, different things. And as, an, as a multi-generational African-American, understanding my positionality as black folks um, means I have to be aware of the way in which, again, black folks has been used as a wedge. As black folks, we talk about, where's our 40 acres in the mule, right? That was the great promise. And I had to ask myself, and I asked this, I've had hard conversations in the black community of like, where, or actually more accurately, from whom were those 40 acres coming, right? And a very clear example of that is uh, uh, a couple of years ago, um, again, Manhattan Beach in the LA area, uh, the, um, the LA County, dealing with the racial reckoning of 2020, decided to give back land uh, to, whoop, what happened? Do it. We lost. Okay, okay there we go. It's back. <laughs> um, that they um, decided to give back land uh, to the Bruce family. So the Bruce family, um, between 1912 and 1920, it was an African and American family. Uh, Willa Bruce bought, uh, purchased two lots of land um, in Manhattan Beach, built a kind of black resort because there was a lot of segregation. Uh, again, as we see, unfortunately, often enough, when black folks are doing really, really well, making some strides, uh, again, white folks get angry. And so the uh, real estate groups uh, decided to go, get together and uh, convince the Manhattan Beach City Council to condemn the resort site and use eminent domain to quote unquote build a park, which never got built by the way. Um, and so again, 2020, 40 acres in a mule, uh, the city gives it back, but again, there was like a fire station there, like what is it they're supposed to do with the land, um, the Bruce's family, and so they decide to sell it back for $20 million. So again, reparations, 40 acres in the mule, because they're nowhere that I was able to read or research in the conversation with the Bruce family that they decided to even, let's just say, share a part of the $20 million uh, with the Tongva communities, the Tongva tribe, the Tongva nation, whose land this originally is. So this is for me is like the warning situation of why we need to understand what is our positionality vis-a-vis -vis indigenous sovereignty as the land, because we don't want to be caught up building our, our lives on the land and the blood and the dispossession of Native American peoples. So this is just an example again of like mistakes and they had the opportunity to make amends. So hopefully this is gonna be on a video somewhere and the Bruce family sees this and decides to give like, you know, maybe even like, you know, $5 million, $10 million, again, to Tongva community as a way of reparations for the true owners of the land. Um, but again, there's, there's things I'm constantly learning. Um, two, two areas in which I've uh, failed in terms of putting indigenous first, putting Native Americans first, um, is being present or actually not being present. And part of that comes because the, the, at OCAD University, there was cultural competency training where we spend a day uh, learning about the experiences of First Nation, Métis, and Inuit peoples with the residential schools. Um, and it is, a, it is a hard experience uh, because, again, being multi-generational African-Americans, like the history of dispossession 
right, is not that far history. So in that event, I actually shut down completely um, because I was being triggered by the closeness in the situations. But it meant, right, that I couldn't be present for my indigenous colleagues as they are participating in this experience as well. And it's manifests itself in other ways in which, you know, again, I have to remind myself put it, to put Native Americans first, which means being present, fully present in their struggles, in their joy, um, in, the, in their resolution uh, to re-engage in, um, in indigenous sovereignty. The one that I consistently, even still now, struggle with is uh, colonized time and task. So again, I am a person who gets things done. Uh, there's a Gantt chart that exists in my head every time I introduce a project, and I am deeply rewarded for that in my career, right? Because it's like, oh, Dory, we rely on you because the train's moving on time. Um, but in this situation, there was a giant project that I was doing uh, called It's My Future Toronto, where we're engaging uh, indigenous black and POC youth and designing the futures for themselves. I assembled this like really complex team and I had met this amazing, amazing uh, woman named Camille Usher, uh, who I wanted to invite to participate in the project. And uh, so the way I approached it, as I do, is I sent the Gantt chart. And the task that I had signed her was, can you help, uh, again, help us in recruiting members of the indigenous community to participate? Uh, can you help us with like how we might formulate a specific land acknowledgement? And crickets, didn't hear anything. And again, I sent another email saying, hey, I sent an email before, just wanting to know what's going on, crickets. Um, and then we were in a, a, a meeting together, you know, so we had a little face-to-face -face time, even if it was digital. And I was like, hey, let's set up a call because I've been, you know, wanting to engage with you and talk. And so we set up the call, Zoom call, and, you know, I was like, hey, just checking in, what's going on, da da da, I've been sending emails, you really want, I thought we were excited to engage together, la 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 la. And then I was like, at some moment, I just saw the expression on her face. And I said, I did that thing, didn't I? And she's like, yeah. And the thing that I did was in my desire to get the trains moving, you know, I didn't discuss how the project should be set up. Right, I just assigned task. And the task I assigned her, did, again, didn't take into account the, all the other brilliances that she would bring, right? It's just like, oh, indigenous person, can you help us with engage with the indigenous community? So I called, I call, like, she didn't, even, she didn't even have to say anything. I saw it in her face how I had messed up. I had messed up. But she is generous and loving, and we had a conversation about it. And while she said, I, I'm not going to engage in this particular project, again, there's going to be other opportunities and, you know, like the relationship, it wasn't broken. And it wasn't because we had the conversation. I made amends, which in this case was like, leave me alone because I'm working on my PhD dissertation right now, so I don't have time for your mess. Uh, and But also, like, don't break the relationship. Like, if other opportunities come up, feel free to engage me as a full 360 degree person in the planning and organizing and structuring of what you wanna do. And the next project that came up, um, I did. And we have a really good relationship. Um, and those amends, again, help keep the relationship moving forward. So in all of this, again, in the process of decolonization, we will mess things up. No one knows how to do this. Um, and I have learned quite painfully um, that the act of calling you out is an act of love. That they are saying, I want to be in good relations with you. 
So stop doing the stupid thing that is breaking our relationship. And so every time people are like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? It's like, hopefully you're in a generous community where you can make mistakes. Hopefully they love you enough to call you out and then stop doing the stupid thing that is breaking the relationship with you. Now, beginning to turn to design, like why is this important? The thing that I learned from working with my indigenous and First Nation colleagues um, is that when you are coming to design from a perspective of decolonization, and by that, it was like deep collection to the land, deep sense of relationality to all my relations, right? That what you end up designing for is liberatory joy. My students ask me like, okay, what should I be doing? What should I be, how should I be thinking about the values of my design? It's like, okay, number one, every design decision that you make should be how is this creating the conditions for liberatory joy? Liberation is because the things we've been designing for the last 500 years have, again, meant to enslave people. Whether that's the cell phone, mobile phone that I can't stop looking at because it's been designed in order to draw my attention constantly and feed me dopamine every time I look at it, right? Um, and joy, and joy just comes from connection. Again, the separation of black, indigenous, POC, and white folks, right? All of that is the, the colonial structures are meant to divide. Divide us from each other, divide us from our relationship to the land. And the pure feeling of joy, why we love music, why we love dancing, is that it facilitates connection to one another. And so, decolonizing design in the sense of like putting Native Americans first provides us with a pathway for everything that we make contributing to liberatory joy. So key takeaway, figure out your positionality vis-a-vis -vis Native American sovereignty as the land. Learn the colonial histories of the places where you are. Make mistakes, but also make real amends and design objects that can transmit liberatory joy to the body and community. Now for part two, um, making amends. So again, let's now talk about how you more deeply making amends. And DEI is not decolonization. DEI is, again, the invitation for people to join the system. Decolonization says, hmm, Perhaps these systems are corrupt from their very beginning. Again, 40 acres and a mule is DEI. Decolonization is land back. And what's your relationship to that? But let me explain how you begin to make amends in that sense beyond it. So I just want to shout out this illustration, uh, again, by Anna Aggie. And so in the book, there's lots of illustrations. Um, because I wanted, and the brief to her was, I want you to read through the chapter and find the most emotionally charged moment. Um, and so the moment that she selected, which is good because that was the most emotionally charged moment, is me talking about the process, the painful process of bringing about transformation in an institution. Um, it is uh, evoking the, the, the movie slash series Roots, which I watched as a child. Um, and it's evoking the fact that, again, when we put these people in positions, we expect them to do heroic things. But when you ask someone to be a hero or shero or a non-gender defining role, um, you're denying them their basic humanity. And so part of this was trying to, to remind people who are reading the book that regardless of whatever I may have done in the chapter that you're going to read, that is a person. And this work is painful. Um, and if you're going to engage this work, I'm writing this so that you know 
how to engage with the pain that's going to come. At OCAD, we took a couple of steps in terms of making amends. The first thing that we did is we addressed the institutional racism and white supremacy that was bit, built into the institution. Um, so a lot of this, like, I wish in so many ways people did this because of like their own goodwill. Um, but for OCAD University, it was because they got sued um, but for discriminatory practices. And so as part of the making amends for that, they had to institute a task force on underrepresentation driven by the president's office. Um, again, establish like a, a, a series of plans. And I, this is all before I arrive. I arrive in the position of Dean of Design, which is an extraordinarily powerful position in the institution because it's like 70% of the student and 70% of the faculty. So even in things that we did, uh, I'd say like, because the, the faculty of design did it, it gave the appearance that the rest of the institution was doing it as well, which wasn't always the case. Um, we also had to have the hard conversation. So there's a series that I initiated around having conversations of whiteness without white supremacy. Because at this time, still 88% of the faculty is white. So the question is, what is the role that they play in this decolonizing process? And one of it is like, own your whiteness, but let's talk about the way in which you can engage in whiteness without white supremacy. Because it's the supremacy part that's the problem, not the whiteness. Um, and, you know, again, we had to break down, like, what do we mean by whiteness? That was the thing. I, I wrote what was called, in the first couple of weeks, called The Dispatch, which was the kind of newsletter thing that I sent out. And I, uh, I sent my first dispatch and I experienced lots of faculty members coming to my office crying because I called them white. Because I, I, I was so shocked because I thought any institution that is calling for a dean that could facilitate a process of decolonization and indigenous revitalization, that they would, they would already know what whiteness was, but no, they were like, how dare you call me white? Um, and again, as a leader, you can't ignore that. Like, like there was in my head a sense of like, where are you coming from? But it was a sense of like, okay, we're education, right? We're educators. So maybe some of them, like again, if you grew up in England, maybe you've never thought of yourself as white. So let's educate. So one of the things we had to do was figure out, okay, let's talk about whiteness. Now, for me, one of the amazing discoveries that I did, which is a great, amazing lecture by uh, Dr. Jacqueline Battalora, is that whiteness has a time and a place. A time, 1681, a place, the Colonial Assembly of Maryland. <laughs> God bless America, right? And, uh, and the reason why they had established a sense of whiteness is that before, everyone was like British, Christian, and other, right? And uh, when there was uh, Bacon's Rebellion um, that just preceded these, you know, 1670s or whatever, and uh, guess what? Like white folks, enslaved Africans, black free people got together and they said uh, one positive things, which is uh, European overseers, we want better working conditions, we weren't whatever, whatever. The negative part of it is that they were also saying, uh, and we want you to basically kill more indigenous people because we want their land. So again, all these histories are very complicated, right? Um, and, but in response to that, the, again, white overseers said, oh, we need to divide and conquer these white folks from everyone else. So we're gonna pass some laws. And in that law, we're going to prohibit white people from marrying people of African descent or members of native tribes, because there was a lot of that that was happening, right? Uh, you can no longer free enslaved Africans. Uh, you, as a black, free black folk, you can't hold public office. Uh, this one to me is always like strange, like the beating or whipping of a Christian white servant naked without special order of the justice of the peace is no longer allowed. Um, and then uh, enslaved Africans and free blacks are prohibited from having guns. Mm -hmm. And 
So that is where white supremacy comes from, and it's built in every single institution. And the goal of this was not to uplift white folks, right, poor, indentured white folks. It was to push the conditions of black and indigenous folks so far down that, again, working class white folks would choose to be in alignment with their white aristocratic overseers than being in true solidarity with those who actually really share their interests. And I, I hate to say that that structure still ex is experienced every single election today, but it means because it has a time and a place, because there was a moment of true solidarity, guess what? We can end white supremacy in our institutional structures. We can, again, come together in solidarity to overthrow our aristocratic European leaders. But it's, again, it's also understanding that it's, it's, it's you know, whiteness is a culture that is now built into all these institutions. So again, the other thing that we're finding is that you can put black, indigenous, POC bodies in all these institutions and they still will reproduce white supremacy because they're there, again, like in 40 Acres in the Mule, they're there to join, they're not there to dismantle. And so understanding that the true enemy is white supremacy cultural values that need to shift and change. And so we did a lot of work in that, right? Understanding, oh, the incident, like, and institutions have, I don't know, for some reason, a hard time understanding like that they're racist and white supremacists. Like someone asked me, Dory, like, what was so different of you about being a dean compared to everyone else? It's like, because I assume that the institution is racist, white supremacist, classist, uh, homophobic, anti-everything, right? Um, but I am here and present in order to try to change that. So I have to first understand that what I'm dealing with and not assume an innocence of the institution. So the second step we did was actually change the way the institution recruits, hires, and hires indigenous and black faculty. And I'm going back to indigenous because I'm talking about the Canadian situation. <laughs> okay, so normally when an institution says, okay, we admit that diversity is important, what they look for is the super token. I myself am a super token. And what I mean by that is I'm an individual from structurally excluded, excluded groups whose talents are so desired by institutions that they're able to overcome their innate aversion to the individual's identities in order to have access to those talents. So my talent is I am super, super smart in a way that's useful, right? Like I'm a strategist born, I was a born strategist. Right, that means I see patterns that emerge before they've actually emerged for everyone else, which is really useful for planning because it's like I get a little edge on what the future might be and I can tell you about that so that you can be prepared for that future to potentially come. So institutions find that extraordinarily useful, right? Because the big fear is what's gonna happen in the future. And if you have someone who could be like, I will tell you that this is possible, they get really excited. So that's my that's my super token like talent that everyone loves. Oh, but they also hate me. And I have to understand that. I have to understand like I'm gonna be tone policed. I understand that they're gonna call out everything that I do. And um, and the reason why they're doing so is again, they love the talent, don't necessarily love me. Um, and, and if I go into that situation assuming that they will love both me and my talents, I will get hurt painfully. So understanding that organizations normally are looking for a super token, again, understands that they're, they're looking for someone who has already succeeded in the system. Again, I have a PhD from Stanford, went to Bryn Mawr College in my undergrad. I ran the US National Design Policy Initiative. I went over to Australia and created a role of Associate Dean in Learning and Teaching that was specifically designed for me in order to be able to do that, right? I don't even believe my resume when I look at it. 
So it's a thing where super tokens are dangerous because they set, first of all, this impossible standard by which an institution can say, well, we would hire more black faculty if they were all like Dory, right? Um, and it's also, again, there's the danger of being the super token and so deeply believing in your talent that you forget that they don't like you, they don't love you. Um, and that you are so wanting to be like, I am so special in this institution, that you decide to be the gatekeeper yourself, understanding your positionality. Now, there are different ways to guard against being the curse, I say, of the super token. Um, the first strategy is to do cluster hires, which I spent a lot of time today talking to the DEI team about. Um, cluster hires are important because, again, the super token is normally the only one. And uh, as the only one, there is so much pressure that is put on the only one. All the students want to come to you because, oh my gosh, you know, again, you speak the language that I need to hear. You reflect back on me. So again, I'm not able to do my research, I'm not able to do this because I have to service, lovingly service the students because there's no one else to serve them. Um, again, the, um, they're in isolation, which means they don't have necessarily a, a, a supportive community around them which means sometimes they leave. If you find there's a high turnover, there is a reason because you only hired one. So the cluster hire begins to build a, a nucleus of culture, a nucleus of community that will help in many ways uh, the brilliant people that you hire in uh, diverse ways to create a safe and accountable space for themselves as they go about doing the work of transforming the institution. Um, and there's things that we had to tie together in terms of this. So the first cluster hire we had was in putting indigenous first, an indigenous cluster hire. Um, and the thing that we sort of, you know, talk about the fact that it's like, and we got this ideal from UC Riverside. Um, at OCAD, I had two years of failed searches because the institution and I didn't know necessarily how to hire for diversity. Um, I was not going to put another group of uh, diverse candidates, and again, we were doing Indigenous first, so Indigenous candidates through the painful experience of being putting themselves forward and getting rejected by the committee because the committee didn't know how to read their resume. So I go to my uh, go to my provost, my boss, and I say hey, there's this cluster hire thing that I think might help. And it's coming from UC Riverside. And they brought in like a whole bunch of people to build community. Can we do that? And then I go to my fellow deans. And I had three lines of hiring. One dean and the dean of art had one. One dean and the dean of uh, liberal arts had another. And we said, we can hire five indigenous faculty members all in one swoop. And uh, because it didn't cost more money, it was already allocated, uh, the provost's office said, okay, from the financial perspective, you could do it. But oh, we had to change so much because the institution didn't have, let's say, HR didn't have a way to actually track people's identities. Because in Canada, there's a lot of like weirdness about people identifying by race. It's not like here where everything is defined by race. Um, and uh, so they had that. And then we wanted to have the provost as the chair because, like I said, I couldn't trust my faculty to do this evaluation. So uh, they had to go to the faculty association, the union, and get approval for a whole new hiring structure. All these things had to move in order to make this happen. And it did. Um, the part that people forget is that, and it was wildly successful. And it was wildly successful in a couple of ways. Uh, the institution actually didn't expect for there to be a lot of applications. There was over 40 applications for one, five roles. Uh, now, the work of getting 40 applications was really up to me and Ryan Rice, who was my Mohawk colleague. Uh, he is a world-famous curator. 
So it has like a Rolodex of 30 years of indigenous artists. I had spent the two years previous, because of all the failed searches, right, researching every indigenous designer in North America, South America, uh, Canada, and sending individual emails for them to understand that this position was being offered. Please apply even if you don't want the job because we just need to demonstrate to the institution that they, again, indigenous designers exist. So we had over 40 applicants for the five roles, success number one. Um, and then that success led to other success. Um, again, we had the black cluster hire a couple of years afterwards. Um, again, extraordinarily painful considering we had the success for the indigenous cluster hire. But again, this is where we go back to like uh, black folks and uh, white supremacist structures don't mix very well. And so it was an epic, epic battle, which I talk about in the book. Again, the institution did the right thing, but honestly, I am still bitter by what I had to do to make that happen. And then we had another indigenous cluster hire, and this one just in design because in, at, we had six design fields and I was able to convince the institution that we needed to create, again, more density of indigenous knowledge, specializations, lived experiences, community engagement in just design as the largest faculty. Now, originally they said you only had three roles, only three positions, uh, but because we had the success of the first indigenous cluster hire, because we had the, sec the success of the second, the second black cluster hire, that with this cluster hire, they were like, when, we, when, we, when they saw again the list of amazing, brilliant applicants, they were like, yes, you can have more because there's no way we're ever gonna gather this group of amazing indigenous designers again. But we had to do some internal work because again, it's not just a matter of like, write the call and they will come. We had to change the criteria of evaluation to take into account structural exclusion because the way in which we wrote our position calls assume that people already had eight years in some ways of post-secondary experience in studying and teaching. Now, again, a lot of black and indigenous communities have been by design kept out of post-secondary institutions. And they have succeeded brilliantly just in other domains. Um, some of them are like, we call it like praxis stars. Right, where they went out in industry and just did what they needed to do and like, again, succeeding flawlessly and doing things that are actually quite transferable to the academic context. Some of them are, again, community connectors, deeply, deeply doing the work in community, writing, again, proposals and grants. We do that in academia, giving, sharing knowledge across generations. That's what we do in academia. All these things that do happen just in a different context. And wouldn't it be amazing if we can bring those in that, that those other ways in engaging with knowing and being into our institution. And this is not, this is like the result. That's not even like the most current result because there's like more that we've hired. We've hired two more indigenous faculty. We've hired two more black faculty. Um, that was just like the snapshot that I took when we were actually all able to get them together to take us, <laughs> again, a Zoom photo. Um, thirdly, we adapted the governance to place First Nations, Métis, and Inuit community members in positions of power and influence. Um, um, OCAD has always had an indigenous, now the term is Indigenous Education Council, and their job is to advise the university um, on, again, what the things that they can be doing in terms of supporting indigenous education. Uh, in the last couple of years, there was the, the, the decision was made to have representation on uh, the Board of Governors, which makes all the economic decisions of the institution, and Senate, which makes all the academic institutions on, on academic institutions, um, academic decisions in the institution, uh, because having that representation and having that voice, um, again, makes, holds the institution accountable. Uh, they actually just two years ago, they hired an executive director of indigenous engagement whose role it is to advise the president 
um, and to hold the university accountable to indigenous communities. Um, there's an elders in residence, um, and it's multiple elders, because again, there's a way in which institutions like, oh, we have our one elder, which you don't own, right? And then they're like, tire them out, right? So it's like, let's have multiple elders in residence, and we pay them, and we offer them tobacco, and we do all the protocols and we make sure like that, again, we're supporting them in their ability to support the spiritual well-being of the indigenous faculty students um, and staff, as well as guide the university. And then we make sure that, again, at Okata University, even with the new hire coming in, uh, we have an indigenous black and POC decanal team. Uh, and so, and again, the power structure is different in every institution. And I will tell you the power structure at OCAD University is in the decanal team. The real power is as Dean is designed, if I said no to something, it did not happen. That's when you know you have real power and the power at OCAD is in the decanal team. Um, and, um, and again, we've had diverse leadership um, as program chairs. And this is only possible when you have a critical mass of diverse faculty that they, not everyone has to be on, on like poor Ryan Rice, who at one time was literally on every committee that there was at OCAD University. And now it's like, he's chilling back and others are there to take the place and learn how the institution works. So that's like, it's just, it's also changing the governance structure so that one can be held accountable. And then again, achieving critical mass to be able to change the curriculum. So OCAD University, um, uh, the Office of Faculty Development um, through a wonderful um, Anishinaabe woman named Nadia McLaren who worked in that office, worked with the elders um, of the community to get permission for OCAD University to develop um, a framework of guidance around the medicine will um, and, uh, and a set, and I'm not gonna show you all of them, a set of in, um, indigenous learning outcomes to be embedded in the curriculum. Because again, as an institution, we can't tell faculty members uh, what to teach per se, but we can uh, embed, work with them to embed um, indigenous learning outcomes in which they have to do the work to figure out how they're going to teach them, right? And then it shows up in the work. So this is uh, Assistant Professor Howard Monroe, who's Red River Métis. And uh, one of the things that he did was he took the uh, first year industrial design course and he re reinterpreted the design process around the seven grandfather teachings. So again, that's his work, so I can't go in it. I don't have permission to show all of it, but I have permission to show this one. Um, so again, like respect, which is a really important value, that, that's about the research phase um, and how you recognize, uh, you respect the fact that you don't know everything, so you have to do research because <laughs> there may be others who know more, right? Um, again, this is an assistant professor, Sangan Nagar, and working in partnership with the uh, organization called um, uh, that works with bringing forward indigenous languages uh, created a brief in which the advertising students um, created uh, posters, websites, brochures um, that gave a sense of like, okay, these are the major names of things in the city of Toronto that are actually. Um, again, in some cases, Mohawk, Anishinaabe uh, names of places. So you're living on indigenous lands, right? <laughs> again, uh, OCAD University, because we have a critical mass of black faculty, was able to establish a black studies minor in art and design um, because there was enough faculty member who could teach it and enough courses that had that content to be developed. And again, we, there's works that are being written that supports this work. 
And so faculty were doing the hard work to do the reading, to do the learning, to write the books in order to be able to create this knowledge uh, which can now be embedded in curriculum. So, key takeaways. Um, again, make sure that you're focused on decolonization by putting Patwin people's demands first in your DEI uh, hiring plans. The way in which we stacked kind of our priorities is that uh, local indigenous first, so this would be Haudenosaunee, uh, Mohawk, I mean, Haudenosaunee, um, Anishinaabe, uh, again, Métis are from another place, but there's a lot of them that was living in the city, as well as like some representation. Then the next level was like, okay, a Turtle Island general regional um, indigenous people. Um, then the next thing is looking at international indigenous. Again, the importance of having that local nucleus of understanding is that anyone who comes into the institution needs to know the place. And so you need to make sure that you have people who can guide the institution and every student, every faculty member in understanding that place. And then from there, you expand wider so that they can, everyone can have a conversation and a discussion in relationship to that place and the people of the place and the custodians of the place. That is doing the true work of decolonization. It's not a global thing, it's a local thing. Um, you have to stop seeking the super token. And again, the way to get over that is like, if you are only doing a search for one person, yes, of course, you're gonna, you're gonna choose a super token because they're the ones who have all, like they have the stacks of all the accomplishments that makes, again, everyone feel like, yes, we are, we are smashing you know, our biases. Um, so the advantage of the cluster hire is that it actually allows you to broaden your notion of what is excellence. The super token, again, I, uh, I am excellent as it comes to the academic system. But there are other people, I hate to say it, who are just as brilliant as I am, um, who've operating in different systems, operating in systems of community, operating in systems of, of, again, like work, everyday work. And if you want to do true inclusion, you have to include them into the work of building the institution itself. Um, because again, um, you want to offer the students different pathways of success. Um, and an academic pathway is just one of many that can be taken. Um, you have to accept that uh, the culture and practices will change and cede power to those who have been structurally excluded. Um, and this is, I say, is like particularly like, like again, white faculty have always, especially white men have said like, what do I do in all of this? Um, and I say there's two things that you can do. Um, one is the seed space. But don't like exit, right? Just seed space because one of the things that happens when you've been structurally excluded, you actually don't really know how the system works. Guess what? Generally, white men of privilege know how the system works. What they don't know is all the pain points in those systems from everyone else because it's been designed to, for them to avoid pain points. So we actually, you need the collaboration. I can tell you, this is where, this is where the system is causing pain. But I don't know how that all fits together. Again, my white colleagues say, ah, oh, so this is how it works with this and this and this and this and this, and this is how the system works. And then we can say together, ah, oh, now let's dismantle this system together. I can't do it on my own because I haven't been part of the system enough to see it how it works. Again, you can do it on your own if you're a white man because you don't even feel where the system is hurting. It is actually the work together that dismantles systems. Um, write a call that embraces, again, the community from their own ex perspective. And three things we look for when we write a call is one, what is it? We want your lived experience. Two, and its connection to community. 
And this is really, really important because there's some people who might tick the box, but you're not just embracing an individual, you're embracing an individual and the community connections that they bring. So if you're ticking the box, but you have no community connections, I really like you are useless to me. And then thirdly, it shows up in their works because you have some people who, again, might tick the box, might have community connections, and it shows up nowhere in their work because they've assimilated. And again, I feel bad for you, but it means you're not helpful to the student who comes and says, I come from this identity and I want to find a way to bring that right into the work that I do. They can't help because they've spent their entire career avoiding bringing who they are into the work that they do. So they're useless as well. So it's using, it's again, you're looking for people who A, have the lived experience, B, have a connection to community, and C, it shows up in their work because those are, the th those are the people who can teach all of the beautiful identities that the students have, how to bring and engage them into the work that they do. And sometimes, again, you know, like some people might learn in the process of doing that, but it is really hard to learn something while you're also trying to teach it. And there's a lot of harm that can come sometimes when, when especially sometimes looking for a super token, <laughs> they're not bringing all those pieces together. And actually now I would add a fourth thing, which is looking for someone who is actually there to dismantle the system. Again, a lot of people want to join in. And like I said, as African-Americans, the whole movement of social justice is like, let us join the system, let us join the system. So we have unlearning we have to do because it's not just about joining the system. It's like, oh, Let's be in solidarity to dismantle this system so that we can bring about liberatory joy for everyone. And lastly, again, change your evaluation, your criteria evaluation to take into account structural, um, structural marginalization, right? Um, because that is where true inclusion comes from. So I'm not gonna leave you hanging because there are some tools that I've developed to help with all of this. Uh, I'm uh, doing a partnership with CalArts where I'm offering um, these online synchronous courses. One is Whiteness Without White Supremacy, which is one of my favorites to teach because it's a very creative process where, uh, again, the brief is uh, identify antidote values to white supremacy culture, uh, identify a person who lives those values. For me, it's Mr. Rogers and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and then do a portrait of them as a way to explore creatively who this person is and, and how you can begin to create a plan of how you're going to practice these antidote values to white supremacy. Um, the second one is hiring for decolonization and cultural justice in the creative industry. So this is like the step-by-step -step process that I've talked about a little bit here, but go into depth with the details and all the materials uh, to use to do that. And then lastly is business transformation for cultural appreciation, not appropriation. Um, there's a way in which organizations, again, in design, we have long conversations about cultural appreciation, cultural appropriation, is this cultural appropriation? And in this course, we look at it like, okay, if you have a problem with cultural uh, appropriation, it just means you are not in relationship with the community. Because if you have doubts, community will tell you where you are culturally appropriating or not. So you're asking this question means you just haven't made the connection. So let's go through all the things in your organization that has kept you from making the connection. Some of it is pay. Why do you get, I don't have the budget to engage with, you know, indigenous community. Um, so, or even if I do, the university pays them like after 60 days. That's not building good relationships because I assure you, most people's bills come in within 30 days. My bills feel like they come in within 15 days. So again, this is a barrier. So in that course is really exploring how the systems, right, that you create is what keeping you from developing respectful and reciprocal relations with cultural communities. And it's because you don't have those relationships that you are even worried about cultural appropriation. 
<laughs> so in conclusion, what might decolonizing design mean? For me, it means putting indigenous first, Native Americans first. For you, it would be putting Patwin first. <laughs> um, dismantling the tech bias in the European modernist project, dismantling the racist bias in European modernist projects, making amends through more than diversity, equity, inclusion. And again, there's always the money question. OCAD did this with no money. Again, I was always having contracting budgets. Um, what the institution did is it did make some hard decisions, but all those hard decisions was about prioritizing this within the existing budget. All budgets are finite. All questions of budgeting is a question of prioritization. This should be a priority because it is the thing that will bring uh, true belonging, true innovation, true liberatory joy to everything that the institution does. So thank you very much, and I look forward to questions. And so is this where I move over to the table? OK. <laughs> Although I feel so lonely at the table. Do you want company? Come join me. Could we get another chair for Professor Cogdell to come <laughs> join Dr. Dory Tunstall at the front? <laughs> but the questions are for our speaker today. And uh, shall I call you Dory? Yes, Like please. we talked about before. Okay, um, we're still ringing. So do we need to turn that off? Or where am maybe, I? Where's, where's the ringing? I think the, the gentleman behind me might have just done that. Okay. How's the ringing now? That might be the I hear it. Do you hear ringing? Okay, that might be the mic. So. I think we might be hearing something else. It, okay. it is, that one is off. Um, so let's just put our hands together again for Dr. Dory Tunstall. <laughs> Thank you, Dory. Support. 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 And I'm Professor James Housefield. If you can't tell, I'm from the Department of Design. And I'd like to invite your voices to be heard with your questions for Dory today. So if you'll raise your hand one at a time, and I see Diego, one of our graduate students here, uh, and then this person in the corner will be number two. Uh, I'll come around to you. Do we want to get a third person on board? Up front, we've got number three, and then uh, remind me when we come back around, and we'll get number four. Diego, I'm going to pass the mic to you. It's live, so just uh, speak clearly for our speaker. Hi. Uh, hi, Dr. Tundal. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. It was super inspiring. Uh, I want to ask you, actually, about something that's in your book, but you didn't uh -huh. talk about, which is the tech bias in... Western uh, society, uh, especially when you talk in your book about how the Bauhaus created the preliminary course and it started to build up. Uh, right now in my uh, master research, I try to follow something similar with the help of my amazing uh, thesis advisors where I research uh, natural fibers mm -hmm. and I started with uh, just linear uh, making of linear things, then move to surfaces and then to volumes. And I feel that that was very helpful for me to visualize the possibilities of the material. But at the end of the day, it's similar to the Bauhaus teaching of dot line and uh, plane. And, plain. and I mean, I, I come from a very Bauhaus inspired education, like my, that was my undergrad. Um, my question is, is there, I found value in that, but do you think that is still, there is there still value in following those uh, structures, just completely modifying them, adapting them, and uh, improving them uh, to include more voices? Um, so uh, what Dio is referring to in the book is that I talk about a class 
that we created at OCAD University, which combined Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander principles of respect, know, care, and share, uh, which was brought by uh, my colleague, Dr. Norm Sheehan. Um, and then I brought the Bauhaus principles in terms of like point, line, and plane, rhythm, all these sort of things. And so we reoriented. So the problem with the Bauhaus is that uh, their underlying ethos was steeped in white supremacy and actually patriarchal white supremacy. And again, I, my thing is I, I approach that with a sense of generosity because quote unquote, their user group, right, were um, mostly white men who was experiencing uh, post-traumatic stress disorder as well as all kinds of like physical ailments coming out of World War I. So they were designing for the broken bodies and the broken spirits of, of white men. And that's not the problem. The problem is that we've made that as a universal standard, which means like if you're not a white man who was experiencing post-traumatic stress disorder and physical ailments from World War I, the whole world that has taken on those values is not designed for you. And considering the majority of us are not that demographic, we've created this whole standard of design that alienates everybody in one way or another. So again, not the problem, but decoupling the white supremacy that was underlying the practices from, let's say, the real research they did around, like, what are kinds of things that just because we're human beings, right, we, we work with point lines and planes, just because, again, we're human beings, we are affected by rhythm. Like, using those kinds of things, ah, oh, that's actually valuable, right? But let's put it in a different set of value context. And so what we did is we put it within a context of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander principles of respect, know, care, and share. So the, the brief was for the students to identify a place, place-based learning, that had strong emotional and cultural resonance for them. And they would spend the module of this course telling stories about this place through sketching again and again and again and again and again. Um, that was valuable because it rebuilt their, like, first of all, there's a lot of things that happen in the teaching of <laughs> design that actually don't go over the principles of it. Um, so it was actually very useful. And that course eventually was taught by all um, Aboriginal faculty members. And they talked about like, actually, it was very useful for them to understand the Bauhaus principles in the context of, let's say, um, you know, one of them was like, so we're from, we're Ganai. And because actually our modality a lot was like wood carving, we do a lot of lines. Again, the desert people use point because they do a lot of sort of things. So like, oh my gosh, like understanding these principles I always now understand why as a Gunai artist, I should probably not do dot painting, right? So again, there's things of like, what I talked about is like that course was a manifestation of reconciliation. How do we take what's valuable in terms of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders ways of being and I, will, I love living under the principles of respect, no care, and share. Like, that's what we need more of. Um, but put it in, in, the, in dialogue, right, with these kind of principles that help you understand and have better facility in terms of the intentionality of what you're making and how that's received, which is what the Bauhaus has kind of categorized in some ways. So I think... In the context of, of reconciliation, that was a good way to approach what it is that we were trying to do. Again, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander values, this is the best, right? Again, understanding that scientific understanding of the way in which we make and we use these things, like, that is the best that we can take from the Bauhaus experience. Don't have to throw away everything. Let's figure out how to put them in reconciliation. There is a hierarchy, right? So again, it is the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander values that is framing the experience, right? So it's, 
It's uh, flipping, right, the value system, but it's taking what is of value in that interaction together in order to create something uh, new and create something that, again, might create the conditions for a liberatory joy in the connecting to place in the connecting and storytelling to each other and the refinement of those things by understanding exactly what happens when you use point, exactly what happens when you care enough to apply color, right? Exactly what happens when you share just also in the visual sense, but also in the oral sense, what it is that you're actually experiencing um, with each other in community. <laughs> And we have another question here in the back. And I feel like I should be giving shorter answers. So <laughs> I'll try to, I'll, I'm always like, I'll try better. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Anuj and I'm a graduate student in performance studies. And that was such a great talk. And thank you so much for breaking it down so simply so that we could keep along with you and for not only talking about, for talking about actually the systemic structures that kind of are the foundation of this. And so for me, the question um, that I was left with it, at the end was when you're training students to, um, to come in and go out into the world and join industry, industry has its own set of desires and momentum and you know it's so embedded also in the nation state and you know in this capitalist system. So I'm wondering what the role, what do you think the role of educational institutions is you know in also regulating industry and kind of mm -hmm. having that back and forth because we can send people out for me, I work with film and um, in media, cinema, and with students who I try to engage in having this decolonizing conversation, but when they go out into the world, they're faced with a whole other set of desires and momentums, right? And so how do we actually kind of negotiate that? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to be brief in this response, but there's kind of three different ways to think of it. Um, first of all, um, there, I say, uh, as companies are engaging with our students who have graduated with these uh, new understandings, they are actually valuing that because it is a global world with local things and having our students actually have the cultural competency to be able to engage in that in a way that the companies are like, oh, this is valuable for us because, I mean, capitalism is forced to engage, right, in order to be able to drive more, fuel more, get more clients, more whatever, whatever, whatever right? So there's a certain extent to which, like, having the, uh, like, having the cultural competency to be able to do so in respectful ways, in ways that are not harmful, again, that adds to the bottom line. And so they, again, there's a bit of a surprise that happens, right? Um, but there's also that bit of like, oh, actually what they bring, they're, they're, what they bring is these great skills and this, you know, whatever, but they also bring a level of cultural competency that can help us do better, grow better, right, as a company. The second part of it is that we also do a lot of work to, again, empower the students around who they are. We, we, I am like, I keep it real. So it's like, again, in the book, I'm like, you're gonna encounter this, you're gonna encounter this, you're gonna encounter this, you're gonna encounter this. Um, and so the, sometimes the only thing that you have is your connection to yourself, which we have built up, right? Like we, I like, I want you to walk into this space feeling arrogant and entitled to the whole entire world based on who you are because the rest of the system will spend all its time trying to like whittle you down into nothingness, right? So I want you to be as big and bold as you graduate. Know what to expect, because I don't want you to be hurt or surprised, right? But I, we're gonna embolden you and empower you to at least be present in who you are, regardless of what is happening around you in the institution. Um, and the third thing is like, again, part of the reason why I left academia and I'm now trying to work with industry is exactly like that problem is like, okay, 
Um, I have brought in so many amazing leaders within OCAD University that I have to leave in order to give them space to lead. Uh, now, again, I'm in a position where I can rock into a large corporation with a book and say, hey, let's do some work in, in transforming you so that you become a accountable space that will not hurt the great egos and entitlement that we have developed in these students in terms of knowing who they are and knowing the value of what they make to themselves, to their communities, and thus to the world, right? And so part of me is, part of my transition now is to begin to do that work with institutions and organizations so that can, they can make the change. Um, and then that, again, reinforces why more educational institutions should be doing this because now industry will begin to demand it. And right now we're experiencing a retreat um, in terms of like the work of DEI and all these stuff, but that just shows you how successful those uh, those initiatives were because like, again, those who are still holding on desperately to a world that is oriented around white supremacy culture values and patriarchal values, like they're running scared that the world is changing um, and they don't have a place in that world. Um, and so in that sense, like I take all of this push back that's happening as an indicator to double down on the work because it's actually working, right? It's actually working. <laughs> and you had a question for me, by the way. Hi. Hi. Um, oh, my name is uh, Christian. I'm a third year art history major with an emphasis in museum studies. And I kind of wanted to ask uh, some advice on the institutional level for someone like me who's fresh in higher education and academia. And I have a lot of uh, cultural uh, initiatives in my personal studies where I have to tackle a lot of um, applications of West African and diasporic indigenous art and application of that in my research um, to kind of supplement the lack of representation and inclusivity in our curriculum basis in the department as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so my question is for you is, how can students like me, who have a personal drive and initiative to showcase African indigenous art and our own cultural heritage and apply that and maybe even rally to see any type of change or inclusion within the curriculums that we have offered at the undergraduate level? Mm -hmm. um, so every single change that happened at OCAD University was um, advocated for by the students themselves. And it's, that, is, that is your, like, and even if you want to look at it like in a consumerist way, it's like your tuition dollars are powerful in terms of advocating for change in your institution. Because the thing you can say is, I will walk to another institution and your enrollments will drop. And you will really, you know, like you get that, like use the consumerist power to advocate for the change. Now, like things happen, things happen quickly. So again, student advocate, 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 advocate. Um, uh, you know, if you have the time and thing, again, be at the table. If there's like a student union, be at the table. If there's a committee that has student representation, be at the table. Um, because there's two things that drive institutions to change. One is in some ways the advocacy of the student body. And second is like shame, <laughs> right? in terms of like the PR aspect of it. So the other thing that I say again to students is that make sure you're building community outside of the institution who is willing to, again, to advocate um, um, on your behalf. There were so many changes that happened at OCA University because I was able to say, 
You might try to shut me down because you think I'm one person, but I am multitude. And I, you know, I for a year hired my own PR person to make sure that the institution was not able to bury the stuff that was happening, right? Because they weren't, they, it was a risk to do that. Again, I had community, I made sure the institution knew that I had community who had my back. And that community will come like, and this is where like the, um, let's say in this like, like the Indigenous Education Council changed everything for the institution because it was one of those things like the institution, as it does, did some harmful stuff. Um, as institutions do, they try to bury it a little bit. The students went to, again, their community, and they said, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening, this is what's happening. And again, the Indigenous Education Council, let's just say, held the institution accountable so that things that normally get buried, first of all, was dealt with. Second of all, they changed immediately. It's amazing how quickly an institution can change when there is the kind of community pressure to make it change. So continue to advocate. I know it's exhausting, but I, I say like you're doing it for the next generation. Um, make sure you're not isolated. So connect with community and, and out, connect outside. Like part of the thing of like, like, say for me, like in terms of putting indigenous first is like solidarity. As you sometimes if you come in as just your group, they're like, of course, you're self-interested in this. If you come as multitude, you get like the Asian student group, you get the um, Latinx student group, you get the indigenous student group to all come and support because they say, hey, we want that too. Then again, the institution, like there's a part where they're calculating these dollars, they're calculating the reputational risk of not doing this, and then they shift, right, in order to, to make it happen. So those are kind of the strategies that I can tell you work. May not work immediately, because like I said, for me, I had to come in in the position as the dean. There was a lot of that energy was happening. I would say only thing I did is as the dean, it was normally getting blocked by the deans, but having a dean that's like, okay, let's, I'm, let's, let's support this, just opened up all of that energy to really flow throughout the institution. But it wouldn't have been possible if the students weren't advocating. Um, that, is, that is the big driver of change as we are experiencing right now, right? Um, in terms of, again, students saying, we, we deserve a better world, right? Does that help? I think I saw more hands. Do, should we have time for one or two more questions in the public forum, or should we take our voices to the reception? We're past time. We're past time. Okay. So I'm afraid for the sake of time, uh, please, everyone, join me again in thanking Dory and thanking everyone for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.